All right. So let's start with the problem of the day that was just handed in. Uh, this was supposed to help you practice some of your synthesis skills and break it down into more manageable chunks. This is exactly what you should do with synthesis. Um, just look at individual transformations. Oftentimes you can go in loops and things like that, and you saw that here. Um, so for the first one, uh oh, come on. Let me get it going here. We would need 9 BBN followed by hydrogen peroxide and sodium hydroxide. And when we do that, we do the anti-Markovnikov hydration of an alkyne, so it will add to that carbon. Let's just kind of work our way through here. If we go down to the alkene, we need H2 and Lindler's catalyst. I have a question about that quick. Yep. For the first one, if you didn't use the peroxide, would it add into the Markovnikov side? Uh, no, you'd be stuck with your trialkyl borane. Um, we didn't show the whole mechanism for hydroboration oxidation, but you'd be stuck there. Yeah. So you need H2 and Lindler's catalyst. Alternatively, you could use dissolving metal reduction because we're not forming a cis or trans alkene. If you want to go back, there's two steps. First one's Br2. Second step's sodium amid. And you want to have excess. And then for part three, you want to quench it. And that part three step is important because if we're adding excess sodium amide, we can deprotonate our terminal alkyne and form our acetylide. We need to add in water to help reprotonate it. Otherwise, you're left with a salt. And we don't want the salt. We want the neutral organic molecule. All right. If we want to form this alkene, we can do it from our alkyl halide by using sodium amide. In that case, um, even if we add excess, alkenes aren't acidic enough to be deprotonated. They can only deprotonate alkynes. Uh, if we want to go from the alkene to the uh, alkyl halide, we need to do HBr and what else? Peroxide. Peroxide, because we're adding anti-Markovnikov. All right, if we want to do the, uh, going to the alcohol, what reagents would we need? BH3, TH, or whatever. Yep. Hydroboration, oxidation. So that's two steps, and it takes hydrogen peroxide and NaOH. If we want to go from our alkyl halide to our alcohol, what can we do? All we need is a nucleophile, right? So I would just use something like NaOH, right? It's a primary electrophile. It's not going to favor elimination. It'll favor substitution primarily, so you can just add in sodium hydroxide. If we want to go from the alcohol to the alkyl halide. Can, can there be other options for that one, though? Yep, there are other options. You can do tosyl chloride and pyridine, followed by sodium bromide. So you have to convert that alcohol into a good leaving group and then displace a, a good leaving group with sodium bromide. If we want to go from our alcohol to our alkene. You have to have um, a non-nucleophilic base, too. Uh, for which one? After you do the tosyl chloride step, don't you have to have a base? Yeah, so pyridine is our base. Pyridine's a weak non-nucleophilic base in that step. We're going to cover more reactions that involve pyridine today, and you'll see why it's important. All right, to go from our alcohol to our alkene, we have a couple options. Uh, one option is just to react it with H3O plus and have it be concentrated. Do you use something different on that one too? Yep. Or you can do tosyl chloride, pyridine, followed by uh, a base. Okay, see so why is the base there not there? Yeah. For which one? Yeah, because for this one we want the elimination, right? Uh, Actually, excuse me. We in this case, I wouldn't use sodium ethoxide. Let's go back because sodium ethoxide we could do substitution. Let's use DBU there. Okay. Good catch. All right. Let's fill in the last two. If we're going from our uh, aldehyde to our alcohol, what reagent do we need? We saw this yesterday. Sodium. Yep. And then we need some sort of alcohol solvent. So sodium borohydride will reduce an aldehyde to the alcohol. The other method 
is pretty steppy given what we know now. Um, you can go, let me just abbreviate these. I'll call this method A, method B, method C. So you can go A, B, C. Or another method that we haven't seen is PCC, and we'll cover that later. Um, pyridinium chlorochromate will uh, convert a primary alcohol into an aldehyde, and we'll uh, see this reaction on Monday. But for right now, you can do the roundabout way where you follow path A, then follow path B, and then follow path C. Obviously, that's not super efficient, and that's why we've developed other reagents that will oxidize alcohols to aldehydes. Are there any questions with the problem of the day? There's more than one answer, oftentimes four. Uh, synthesis reaction, so don't panic if you did something slightly different. I'll take a look at it uh, and try to give you some feedback before I hand it back on Monday. All right, so let's switch back to our reducing agents chapter and quickly review that. We already saw yesterday that you can do a reduction using catalytic hydrogenation. However, I said that nobody really does that method. It's a pain because you have to literally pressurize a thick uh, vessel with hydrogen. It's not inherently that safe of a process, not easy for scale up. And it's much, much easier just to buy a bottle of sodium borohydride, which acts as a hydride donor and can convert a ketone to a secondary alcohol or an aldehyde to a primary alcohol. And we said that we can't make tertiary alcohols with sodium borohydride because we can't actually have a ketone with a Texas carbon. They don't exist. So we can only make primary or secondary alcohols. And then we showed the mechanism where sodium borohydride transfers that uh, hydride and then gets protonated by the alcohol solvent or water. Um, and that's the overall method. We can reduce carboxylic acids and esters. Um, the interesting thing with this is lithium aluminum hydride will also work on aldehydes and ketones, um, but sodium borohydride will not work on carboxylic acids and esters. So we can gain some sort of uh, exclusivity with the carbonyls that we react with by choosing them appropriately. So we can use that one for all of them, correct? You can use it for all of them. Oftentimes it's overkill, though. It's like trying to kill a house fly with a cannonball. Sometimes you just need a, a fly swatter, right? <laughs> and then we covered the mechanism, which is also very similar, involving a hydride transfer. Um, and we'll cover the mechanism for carboxylic acids in Chapter 21. And then if you wanted to see the mechanism uh, for the problem that we threw up yesterday, I've got that on the uh, handout or on the course notebook as well. So you can take a look at that. Sorry. Yep. I want to ask you the date when you're doing this. I don't understand what causes the ring to open. Okay, so let's, let's quickly go through it. So for the first step, it's taking that hydride from aluminum pushes electrons up to oxygen. Mm -hmm. That's very unstable with that negative charge on oxygen. So that negative charge, that lone pair, will dump down and then ring open. Kind of like um, the examples from um, the other, uh, what are they called? With the bromine and the oxygen, or when you make the bromine ion. Yeah. Oh, yeah, it's, it's kind of like, like that. that a little bit. Okay. So in this case, the lone pair from the oxygen kicks down, ring opens, and then we are left with an aldehyde. This can react with another equivalent of lithium aluminum hydride. And then the very last step is we protonate it with an alcohol. Oftentimes, people will use uh, ammonium uh, salts because ammonium is a very gentle, weak acid, and that will protonate your alcohols as well. And so in this case, you end up with a diol. And we'll talk a little bit more about uh, diols here. Diols, we've seen um, already. So the main method we've seen for making diols involves taking something like an alkene. And we already saw this yesterday. And we can do osmium tetroxide followed by NMO. And if we do that, we get our syndial. So that's all review. And the reason we call it a diol is just simply because it's two alcohols. So di, all is the suffix for alcohol. Conversely, we call it, we can use MCPBA followed by the source of acid. And then we can get our antidiol.
And the nomenclature is slightly different for naming dials. Um, hopefully some of you went through the book and saw the nomenclature for the normal alcohols. For dials, the systematic naming is slightly different. So let's go through an example of this. So when you name a dial, I'll just put a really simple one. You still want to number your longest carbon chain. So in this case, it's just one and two, right? So what's our parent chain? Ethane. So in this case, it'd be one, two, ethane, dial. So we don't say one, two, ethanol. We say one, two, ethane, diol to indicate that there are actually two alcohols on there. You could have a one, three, diol. You can have a one, four, diol. The numbers before um, just simply indicate where those alcohol groups are coming off. Uh, the other frustrating thing for a lot of people is the old terminology that's not uh, IUPAC or not uh, named using the IUPAC rules would be ethylene glycol. So you've got ethylene and then glycol indicates that it's a diol. So you may see either written. Um, try to stick with the IUPAC naming. It's much clearer. It's easier to follow. Um, but you may occasionally see naming where you uh, run into glycols. What's that? I think it's G-Y-C-O-L. Yeah. It's glycol. Yeah, it's glycol. Um, it's a very common industrial yeah. solvent, which is why the naming never got switched to the IU, IUPAC name. Oh, that's what All right, the other method that we've seen recently is by using reduction techniques. So let's say we've got this diketone. We can convert this to our diol by using what reagent? Yep, so one of them is we can use lithium aluminum hydride in excess, and then what do we need to do in our second step? Protonate it, right? So we need some source of protons. Usually water works, but sometimes you can add weak acid. What's the other method here? that we can use? Mm -hmm. So we can use NaBH4, and this can be in any alcohol solvent. So we can make diols using the reduction method that we learned about yesterday. In this case, both of them are ketones, so we can use sodium borohydride. If we want to really go over the top, we can use lithium aluminum hydride and uh, convert both of them. Yep, aldehydes and ketones have the exact same reactivity for reductions, at least with sodium borohydride. All right, now we're going to switch topics to one of my favorite topics in organic chemistry. And this is Grignard reagents. So I've got a picture of Victor Grignard. I'd like to point out a few key facts about him. He got a Nobel Prize in 1912. And he's got the best mustache. <laughs> I can only dream to one day grow a mustache as epic as that. <laughs> we used to joke that he didn't need to wear safety goggles because if he had a reaction explode, his mustache would just catch the shards of glass and protect his eyes. I've never seen a mustache that nice, but I'll, I'll get off this now. All right, so. He won the Nobel Prize in 2012 because for a long time in organic chemistry, making carbon-carbon bonds was really, really painstaking. And he developed a new technique uh, uh, where you can make a carbon-carbon bond using simple reagents that are found in most labs. So I'll show you guys the reagent he developed. And people still call it the Grignard reagent. There should be an R there. So the Grignard reagent is really, really simple. You can start with a simple alkyl halide. So that X can be any sort of halogen that you want. Normally, it's a bromide. Um, 
And then all you do is you get magnesium. Normally it's magnesium turnings, really fine ribbons of magnesium. You grind it up with a mortar and pestle. You mix these up together in a uh, aprotic solvent. So I'll write aprotic solvent. And when you do this, the magnesium will actually insert itself in between that halide and the carbon. So you end up with a new organometallic species where that magnesium is now just simply inserted. Now you may be looking at the periodic table and saying, well, magnesium is all the way over on the left. Shouldn't that be an ionic bond? The reality is, is that it is pretty much an ionic bond. So another way of thinking of a Grignard reagent is that this carbon now has a negative charge and you've got magnesium bromide with a positive charge. Now this is really, really great because now we've got a carbon that's a super, super strong nucleophile. So super strong nucleophile. And I'm going to put something else in here too. It's also a strong base. Why do you think it's a really strong base? It wants to give away those electrons. Yeah, it wants to give away electrons, or conversely, another way of thinking of it is it wants a proton, right? It's incredibly unstable having a primary carbo carb anion. It wants to react with anything it can find in order to stabilize itself and get rid of that charge. So the overall reaction that we can do with this is pretty unique. So let's write down the overall reaction. If we have a ketone or an aldehyde, we can take some sort of alkyl chain, so I'll label that as R, and then if we turn it into our Grignard reagent, it's got this MgX, that just means that the magnesium's inserted it's itself in between the alkyl halide and the, uh, or in between the halide and the alkyl group. And then in the second step, we'll add water. And we'll go through this mechanism here next, but if, when you do that, you form uh, alcohol, and you can get an R group. So in this case, this will work with aldehydes, ketones, whoop, let me erase this, ketones, or even esters. And we'll cover each of those reaction mechanisms. And depending on which one you use, you can get um, a primary or sorry, a secondary or tertiary alcohol. Um, and we'll kind of see why that makes sense when we go through the reaction mechanism. So let's take the mechanism for this reaction. So if we have our alkyl halide, I'm just going to use an example one, and it's got that negative charge, and then you've Got this magnesium bromide salt. And then in addition to that, you've got your ketone around. This ketone is a very good electrophile, right? The oxygen is electronegative. It's going to pull on those electrons in that bond. So you've got a net dipole. You've got a really good nucleophile, right? and you've got a really good electrophile, they're going to want to attack each other. So this lone pair will come attack that electrophilic site and dump up electrons. Now if we keep track of all our carbons and all our electrons, you can see that you now have an oxygen with a negative charge. And the Grignard reagent has just simply added in. So we're not quite done. If you saw up above, we always have that second step of adding water. So now when we add water to this reagent, or to this intermediate, the oxygen will reach over, grab a proton, and reform our base.
So in this case, we are showing a reaction with acetone, which is a ketone, and we're able to form a tertiary alcohol. We were unable to do that using the sodium borohydride or lithium aluminum hydride method, but now we've actually formed a brand new carbon-carbon bond that we were unable to make before. So let's do a couple example reactions with this just to practice. So let's say we've got cyclohexanone. And for the first step, I'm going to use ethyl magnesium bromide. And then in the second step, I'm going to add water. I want you guys to go through and see if you can do the full reaction mechanism for this. I'll give you guys a hint too and draw up the <coughs> ethyl group. So that's what ethyl magnesium bromide looks like. We've got two carbons. One side is going to have that negative charge. So what will the first step be? <coughs> Yeah, it's going to attack that carbon on the ketone, dump up electrons. So now we've got this new reagent. And then we're going to add in some source of protons, and we can end up with a new tertiary alcohol. It looks like that. So it's a pretty simple but incredibly useful reaction. Let's do one more. I'll leave this up here and then write the reagents down. So instead of using a ketone, let's use an ester. But this time we're going to use methyl magnesium bromide followed by water. And the unique distinction I want to make between this reaction and the last reaction is let's use excess of our Grignard reagent. So first step, like always, will be our nucleophilic attack. This methyl with the methyl group with the negative charge will add in, kick up electrons. <coughs> now you've got an oxygen group with a negative charge. Now, do we just protonate that alcohol? We saw this before with the sodium borohydride. It really, really wants to kick off a methoxy group, right? So the negative charge on the oxygen can kick down and then eject off a methoxide anion. And now we're left with the ketone. So if we only added one equivalent, we could just stop at the ketone. Oftentimes, though, people will purposely overshoot it and do it again, exactly. So if we've got CH3 <laughs> minus that's extra floating around, I'm not going to draw the conjugate uh, anion, or cation, excuse me. If we do this, we get our negative charge. Sorry, we're running out of space here. 
H plus. Actually, let me just do this over to the side. You guys can leave yours however you want it. And we can protonate up that alcohol or that alkoxide directly to the alcohol. So even with ethers, we can add more than one equivalent and we can eject off an alkoxide group and we can still get to a tertiary alcohol. Let's do one other practice one. We'll see if anybody can catch it. Again, let's use methyl, magnesium, bromide, followed by water. Does anybody see a problem? Will the carbon come in and trap the proton? Yeah. So let's go up and see my note. Super strong nucleophile, also a strong base. So we've got a strong base. We've got a carboxylic acid. If you try to do this reaction, you'll be sadly disappointed to find out that you'll just deprotonate your carboxylic acid. Grignard reagents don't work particularly well with carboxylic acids. You have to do a little bit uh, different chemistry if you are going to try to uh, convert a carboxylic acid group. So in this case, you just end up with MgBr. So it's kind of a dead end. This reaction doesn't work well with carboxylic acids. It's simply too basic. Which brings up an interesting point. Yeah? Uh, any other metals? So a Grignard reagent is always done with magnesium by definition. There are other transition metals uh, that you can use, like cuprates. Um, we'll talk about those more a little later, um, but Grignard reagents are the most popular. Uh, there are cuprates, some zincates, um, lithiates even. Um, so for example, you could use any sort of nucleophile during this attack that's a carbon-based nucleophile. A carbon with a negative charge will always want to attack a ketone. That might be a good hint for the problem of the day that a lot of you are working on. Um, but you can um, use any strong nucleophile that you want in order to add into a ketone or aldehyde. Yeah, what did you say? <laughs> I, have a, I have a All right, for those of you that were zoning out, the, nu the nucleophile has a carbon with a negative charge, right? And it's adding into an aldehyde or a ketone. We can have any sort of carbon with a negative charge do that, right? So we've seen examples of how to make acetylides with a negative charge. Those can be great nucleophiles as well. It's not technically a Grignard reaction because it doesn't have magnesium in it, but it can be used to add into a, a ketone or an aldehyde. All right, so we said that this doesn't work well because uh, Grignard reagents are simply too basic. So we have to come up with a plan to try to mitigate this problem because oftentimes we do have acidic functional groups on our molecules, but we still want to be able to do Grignard reactions on them. So we're going to sidestep a little bit and talk about protecting groups. So the warning I gave you guys was that Grignard reagents or reactions are incompatible with protic functional groups or solvents.
What does protic mean again? It has a hydrogen that's capable of hydrogen bonding, right? So alcohols, styles, amines, things like that. They're relatively acidic if we look at our pKa table. If we have a Grignard around, it will pull one of those protons off and just kill your Grignard reagent. So if we are going to do reactions like this, we have two important things that we have to remember. The first thing is use an aprotic solvent. And then the second thing is we have to protect any OH groups. Really, we have to protect any group that's capable of hydrogen bonding or any group that's uh, overly acidic that might get deprotonated, but we're going to primarily focus on protecting a hydroxyl group. So in this case, there's a special trick that we use. And I'm going to show you one really basic one. So if we've got an alcohol, we can react to this with trimethylsilochloride. H3, I'm going to move this arrow down a bit. CH3 with the chlorine. We've got oxygen, which is a decent nucleophile, right? And we've got this chlorine, which is very electronegative. So there's a dipole here. So this oxygen will sneak in, do a backside attack on that silicon, and then kick off our chlorine. Usually this reaction is done in triethylamine. So I'll write NET3. And so when we do this, we now get a new bond between oxygen and silicon. CH3, CH3, CH3. It is. And so we'll talk about that. The very last step that we have is we've got this triethylamine that's basic. This will dump down electrons. And now if we look at this, we can say, all right, first of all, it's no longer protic. And it's sterically protected. Right, if you're uh, attacking molecule, you're going to have a pretty hard time reaching that oxygen because of those big methyl groups. There's actually a whole variety of silicon-based protecting groups, probably about a dozen of them. There are some of them where those methyl groups are even replaced, two of them are replaced with tert-butyl groups, and that gets even bulkier so that it's even more stable. So we can uh, tune our protecting groups um, by using sterics and by blocking that oxygen with some sort of oxygen-silicon bond. The problem is we want to get this off, right? because eventually we want our alcohol back. This is just a simple protection step to allow us to do a Grignard reaction, and then we want to remove it in the end. So we have to find a really, really tiny atom that can sneak in and then pop off the silicon group. So if we look at the periodic table, what's the smallest atom with a negative charge that can act as a nucleophile? Fluoride, right? Because fluorine's electronegative, it has a negative charge. It's super, super tiny. It can actually sneak in. And so if we add a source of fluorine in, whoop, draw this over here. I'll just call it F minus in quotes. This will do a deprotection. 
and we'll go straight back to the alcohol. So this reaction is entirely reversible. And in this case, the fluorine reagent that we use is typically a reagent called TBAF. And that's tetrabutyl ammonium. So we've got one, two, one, two, three, four. Is that right? Yeah. So that's our tetrabutyl ammonium. And then we've got our fluoride. Ammonium fluoride. And this is just a really nice way of getting um, a fluoride anion without having to use something like hydrofluoric acid, which is super nasty to work with. Tetrabutyl ammonium fluoride you can actually buy in a solution or you can buy it in a powder form and just put it directly into your reaction mixture. All right, so let's see an example of this in action. to go from this starting material all the way to this alcohol. So the question is, can we convert this, al or this aryl bromide into a Grignard reagent? So let's try that. I'm not saying you're wrong. <laughs> so we'll add magnesium metal. We get MgBr positive on it. So the problem we're running into here is we've got a strong base. And we've got a protic site. Right, so if we've got a strong base, it'll reach around to another molecule and pluck off the proton on its protic site. So what should we do before we form our Grignard reagent? Yeah, protect the alcohol, right? So let's cross this out and say that this simply won't work. <laughs> I hear everybody sigh whenever I cross something out. You can leave it in there. I'm crossing it out just to make a point, right? <laughs> so also, the other thing, too, is oftentimes people get sick of writing this out. So they call this TMSCL. I know it turns into an alphabet soup after a while, but it just means trimethylsilyl chloride, right? So we've got three methyl groups on the silicon, and we've got a chlorine. It's a lot easier than writing the full molecule out. Was it C or CL on the end CL. Did I write C? Yeah, CL. All right, so in this step, we'll add in trimethyl silo chloride. And this should be done in a base like triethylamine. The other nice thing about triethylamine is it's not protic, right? There are no protons on it that can hydrogen bond because it's fully alkylated. If we use something like ammonia or diethylamine, then we would have protons that could be abstracted. So we have to use an aprotic solvent. And then also, instead of drawing out the whole silicon protecting group, a shortcut that most chemists use, okay, let me move this over. Shortcuts that most chemists use is they just simply write TMS. So just TMSO means you've got a protected alcohol. Now what we can do is react this with magnesium metal. And 
Now we've got this negative charge, MgBr plus. Our alcohol is nice and protected. What sort of ketone do we need to react this with? If we look at our final product, we have a ketone and then we've got two new carbons. So the ketone needs to have two methyl groups coming off of it, right? So we'll just react this with acetone. So that'll be our first step. And then our second step will be to react it with water to do our deprotonation, or sorry, our protonation. So now we've got our alcohol, with our two methyl groups, we've got our O, TMS. And then what's our last step? Yeah, we need to remove that TMS group. How do we remove a TMS group or trimethyl silo group? Yeah, the TBAF or any source of F minus. So you can see that Grignard reactions are so worthwhile to do that oftentimes we go through very elaborate processes of installing protecting groups and then removing them later on just so we can use this really valuable tool that we've developed. All right, so let's go back to our um, Grignard reactions page. And I want you guys to help me with some synthesis problems. Oh, no. <laughs> I want you guys. These aren't that bad. Whatever. Pretty bad. I get anxiety when you say that. That's what I was going to say. We're going to start with some easy ones. So we need to form this tertiary alcohol from this ketone, and I need you guys to figure out what reagents we need in order to do this. <laughs> We're in the Grignard reaction section, so let's try to use some Grignard reactions. <laughs> Everybody's trying to do ozonolysis of alkenes. It's your crutch, I know. So we've got to ask ourselves, what reagents do we need to convert that ketone into a tertiary alcohol? So I heard somebody say methyl magnesium bromide. A really good thing to look at is we've got one, two, three, four, five carbons there, right? Now we've got one, two, three, four, five, six. That means we added in some new source of carbon. In this case, it's only one carbon long. So we're going to add methyl magnesium bromide. How would we make methyl magnesium bromide if we only had methyl bromide? Throw some, magnesium Throw some magnesium in there, exactly. So that's the first step. The second step would be to add some water to protonate it. So this is turning what was a pretty complicated reaction involving ozonolysis into a two-step reaction. So we're gaining a really valuable tool. Let's try to see, is there any other way we can use a Grignard Reagent to make this tertiary alcohol? No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, of course there is. Yeah. So instead of using that starting material, can we use a different combination of starting materials and reagents? Well, you can use a ketone, just not the same ketone. 
<laughs> I'm, I'm asking you guys. You don't ask me back. <laughs> It's so easy to give up. It's easy. I'm over. I'm over. I'm over. <laughs> my brain hurts. It's like a minute left. I know. I feel like you've been giving up for a while. I think you're going to take it easy on it. What if we started with acetone? That's what I said. And instead of doing that... <laughs> MGBR? Followed by water. So oftentimes there's more than one way to go about doing these reactions, right? So if we look at this one, we've got one, two, three. Our final product needs to have six carbons, so we need to add three carbons in somehow. So in this case, we're adding propyl magnesium bromide in order to install um, three new carbon atoms in a linear chain. So you can do a lot of cool reactions with uh, Grignard reagents. We're going to be using this quite a bit in our synthesis reactions in the future. So if you can, try to go home tonight and do some of the practice problems from the book involving Grignard reactions. And then um, next week when we come in, we're going to talk a lot more about oxidation chemistry.